October 3rd, we have um, lots of giveaways and fun stuff we're going to do. So this book, the reason you got that ticket was a number. This is an Australian Western. Ooh. Set in the 1930s. This is an author I really love. Um, she's one of my authors because it's a Poison Pen Press book. Um, and it's really fun to read about what the Wild West in Australia is like. She's coming here uh, with three other Australian authors. They got a grant to travel to the United States, and she'll be here on the 5th of November, along with a couple of other authors. So <coughs> if you win this book, um, and we have 20-some of them to give away, you can always bring it back and have her autograph it. I really love her books. Um, how many of you have ever read the Franny Fisher, the Miss Fisher Mysteries? Do you know them? Well, we're also the publisher of the Miss Fisher Mysteries, Boys and Pen Press, and they end in 1929. That's kind of the end date for Franny Fisher and the you know wild 20s and the whole bit. And this series starts in 1931, so it's a different look at Australia. And what we, I think, we are so Europe-centric that we don't realize that Australia was an absolute hotbed of fascism and communism and so forth in the 30s, just like Europe was, but we don't tend to think of that. Um, and its social structure was very British. So you basically had a lot of um, wealthy families who had country country homes, country manors, and um, estates where they ran cattle and all sorts of other things. So it was very similar to a British history in that sense, except there's no real Wild West well, Britain, right? Because there's just no land. <laughs> anyway, I think they're fascinating. So that's what we're going to be giving away this evening using the tickets that we gave out to the universe. And I see that our hero of the evening, wearing his cat, is going to come towards us. Would you guys all hold up your books and let me take a picture? Okay, pause somewhere up here so I can catch you. Yeah. Gotta have the famous, no, you're not, you're too far. Come back, come up. Okay. I'm the Instagrammer, so that's why I'm doing this. Hey, all right, stop right there. Stop here, okay. Yay, yay, yay. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Two novellas and a collection of short stories. Okay, so actually 18 mm -hmm. all together. This not good, I can do math. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's exciting. The Arizona Republic is going to write a feature on the store, and they asked me how many authors have signed their first book here, or how many authors mm -hmm. have signed every book here. It's really an astonishing number, but I'm really glad you're one of them. Well, I'm happy to be here as usual. Well, okay, so. oh, thank you. It's great. I'm just glad it's cooling off a little bit, I gotta be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to Wyoming, it's probably tropical. No, I was I was working on my cabin up on the mountains, like it's about eight thousand feet, like it and I was finishing up I guess on Saturday last week, like it and it was flurrying. Oh, oh, wow. I'm like, okay, all right, time to get the insulation in. I had an email from one of my authors back in Maine, and she said, we turned the heat on. I tried not to send her, like, a flaming response. <laughs> <laughs> See where it goes. So I had the great pleasure with my husband of visiting Craig and Judy a year ago last May in Utrecht, Wyoming, population 25, um, and actually staying at the ranch and visiting Craig's writing room and all kinds of fun stuff. It was great, wasn't it? It was, it was. Like, we don't get too many visitors in Ucross, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's always funny, because, like, you know, they're, they're my, the, the local ranchers that live around, you know, where I live, it's funny because they say, you know, it was like, especially after the TV show took off, like, at, um, they said, you know, well, you know, more and more people are kind of showing up and asking where you live. You know, and this is a town of 25. It's not hard to figure out, right? So anyway, um, they said, you know, what do you want us to tell them? Do you want to, you want us to tell them where you live? Like, and I was like, yeah, if they make it all the way to U-Cross, you can go ahead and tell them where I live. Like, and uh, generally what I do, like, it says I do all my library events in Wyoming for free. 
Um, the only thing I charge them is a six pack of Rainier beer. <laughs> and uh, the only thing. And so I've got like a, a shop refrigerator that's full of cans of reindeer beer. And so whenever anybody comes up the driveway to say hi or something, I always get them a couple of cans of reindeer and give it to them. Like, and uh, the, the only problem I run into every once in a while is, is that I'll have Europeans that'll stop, you know? And it's really hilarious like that because the, the first thing that happened was I, had, I was down there working on the irrigation ditch. And I'm down there with a pair of wading boots on and torn up jeans and the t-shirts all ripped up sweaty, you know, bloody, I got a ball cap on, and I'm digging, you know, with this irrigation ditch, working with a shovel and everything, and I see this minivan with Colorado plates, you know, because that's where all the rental cars come from, like in Denver, and so, you know, it, it comes up the ranch road and stops at the irrigation ditch, and I hear, like, the electric windows go down, and this very French voice goes, we are looking for the house of Craig Johnson, and I'm like, well, that would be me, and there was a long pause, and they go, you're kidding. <laughs> Like, no, I, you know, I don't always look, you know, epic and Western. You know. Sometimes it's working Western, you know, sometimes. Yeah. But the horrible thing is that it was funny like that because I had this, uh, there was a couple that showed up on their motorcycle and they were German and they'd read the books like, and they came up the driveway and they said, uh, you know, we talked for a little bit like that and they said, well, you know, we're so excited because we're finally going to be able to have a reindeer beer. And I was like, yeah, you know, don't get your hopes away. <laughs> this is beer country, right? I mean, you know, this is bad. This is not good. Like, so I told him, like, and I said, you know, you really don't want to get your hopes way up or anything. Like, so then I went down and I got, you know, a couple of reindeers out, like, and gave them to them, like, so they could try it. They tasted it and they, they agreed that it's it was a beer. <laughs> so, you know, it was about the end of the conversation. Like, they didn't offer to take any with them. Like, <laughs> Can I tell my French tourist story? Absolutely. I absolutely love this story. So in my former car, you could put a license plate on the front and the back. I can't do it with my present Mercedes. So I'm a patron of the Santa Fe Opera. So at the Santa Fe Opera shop, I bought a license plate, yellow New Mexico land of enchantment. And my my vanity page said was Diva, which was great because at the Valley Hall where I commute to pick up authors and all, whenever they'd see me come in and said Diva, <laughs> just take my car and put it on the side and never charge me to park. Anyway, <laughs> Rob and I went up to Monument Valley and behind the hotel called The View, there's this wonderful loop road. I don't know how many of you have ever driven it. You could drive across Monument Valley, but the real really great stuff, in fact, is this kind of gravel two hour, three hour loop or something behind the view. So anyway, we went in and parked, left the car, and we're hiking all over the whole bit. And we come back to the car, there's this enormous group of people, and they're all like on the car. They're going, <laughs> you know, right? And so they're all posing with the Diva license plate. And his Instagram posts. It was just hilarious. <laughs> so I think I think the French are often surprised when they, yeah. <laughs> when they come to the rest of the United States about what they're going to find. Yes. So does that, because you spend a lot of time in France, you you and your wife Judy are going on a three-week binge. Yeah, yeah. But Judy buys shoes, that's all I know. I yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. what Judy does. Like, and so, but, so do you do you find you run into interesting things like that as an American tourist, or are you oh, just too busy selling books? Yeah, no, I mean, you're, when you're on tour, you know, you're just running from city to city to city like that, but... Um, but still, you know, it, it's still a blast like that because, I mean, it, it's funny because people will say, like, you've been to France like 24 times, like, you know, which parts have you been to? And I'm like, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, and not, not that I know it very well, but I just, I've been to all of it, you know. And uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting the things that they respond to, you know, in the books that are like sometimes different than, you know, what American readers respond to in the books like that. But um, I think it's like the depth of character. I think they're really into the... The characters. I mean, that's as, as what I'm always telling you know student writers. You know, whenever I'm talking to student writers, I'm always saying it's all about the characters. It's all about the characters. I mean, if they're not compelling in some way like that, then you know you're really got an uphill road like that to try and. Uh, the French have always been really fascinated. With, I mean, they loved Buffalo Bill Cody. You know, he used to go over there on tour. You know, with masses of the whole sort of circus act that he took with him. Oh, yeah. The French yeah. have always really related to... No, no, either, yeah. Those were really, really big. Like, I mean, uh, you know, I don't think Buffalo Bill gets as much credit as he deserves. He, he really did kind of implant, you know, all around the world, like, at this this epic romantic image of the American West. Like, and then, um, 
And then what happened was, of course, like about the time it needed a booster shot, it was like post World War II, um, whenever the entirety of Europe was in a rebuilding phase and we kind of inundated them with all of our books, all of our movies, and later all of our TV shows. What was the predominant art form at that period in time? Westerns. Yeah, I mean, there were like 140 Westerns. If you didn't want to watch Westerns, you didn't want to watch TV at that point. Bonanza. Yeah. <laughs> Remember all that great stuff? Maverick. Oh, oh Maverick. Yeah. 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 One of my total favorites. And right. then there was Route 66. And there was, you know, oh, Rifle. Oh, right. Right. Oh, right. So, oh, all right. right. Exactly. Oh, there were just so many great. Isn't it strange, strange how they were, they were so hugely popular and then they just kind of died away, but maybe there'll be a renaissance. It sort of goes that way. Well, it's, it's you know, I think what you're seeing now is a little bit of a renaissance in Westerns. Like, I thought what you're seeing is a little bit more of a renaissance in Westerns that are contemporary Westerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit more of that. Like, I mean, whenever I'm at the Western Writers Association meeting, and I'm talking with, you know, all the writers there like that, that want to rewrite Louis L'Amour and Zane Grey, I'm always telling them, you know, Louis L'Amour and Zane Grey were pretty good at writing. <laughs> Zane Gray, you know, maybe something else, you know, move on and try to do something a little bit different. Like that. And I think, that, you know, one of the things is, you know, the contemporary Westerns, I mean, they, you can deal with a lot more social issues, you can deal with contemporary issues, you know, that type of thing that I, I think is maybe, maybe a little bit more compelling to a modern audience, and certainly to a younger audience. Like, there are a lot of yeah. kids nowadays that will never pick up a, a, a period Western. They just won't do it. You know, they're just not interested like that. But they'll, they'll read a contemporary Western like because it has something to say about you know the world they live in now. So True. and if you go up to Paisman, have, have you been any of these? Try it again. Sorry, we have wine before, so I my <laughs> <laughs> If you go up to Paisman, you should go and visit Zane Gray's cabin there. It's really fascinating. They've maintained it the way it was when he wrote there. Um, it's just like a step back in time. I mean, he spent a lot of time writing his books in Payson. Wow. It's just to the west of Main Street in Payson. You can easily see the turnoff, and I really recommend going. I thought it was, you know, fascinating. No gosh, yeah. So let's talk about Walt. Walt was pretty beat up in the last time you were here <laughs> in this book. Um, and, you know, he's, um, his plan for Mexico was not a plan, actually. It was just kind of bullying his way through it. But he does. Surprise, come out. I'm not spoiling that book by telling you that he's in this book. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. <laughs> wow. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Really. Yeah, no, he kind of does what I think you got to do in those situations. He gets good people and then, you know, does what they tell him to do. Like, that is basically what he does. I don't think he got all good people in his script in Mexico. They were not all You don't all think good so? People. No. Oh, uh, I don't know. I think they did a pretty good job for him. Like, if they got out, like, that was the important wow. part. Like, but, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, the resonance of, of a book like that, you know, the repercussions of it are going to be felt, you know, for like a couple of books afterwards, if you're going to treat the characters in any way, you know, like a reality, like, a, and especially since I like, you know, it takes me like four books to get through one year of Walt's life, you know, each book is only a couple of months after the last one, like, and so Walt's still recovering, you know, from the damage, like, that he, you know, had done to him, like, that in depth of winter, and so he's trying to get through all of that, like that, but not all of it is physical either. Um, he kind of took Henry's advice, you know, when he was on his way down into that portion of Mexico, like that, and, uh, you know, Henry's advice was, is it's, you know, you're going into a war zone, you're not going into a police action here, and so you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to find that guy that you were in Vietnam and dig him out of the footlocker and reintroduce yourself to him because that's the only way you're going to survive this situation, like that, and Walt does, like that, and, uh, and he does survive the situation. The only problem is, is it's becoming exceedingly difficult to get that individual back into the eider down and folded up and back into the footlocker. Um, that guy that Walt was is not wanting to go away, you know, very quickly. And so Walt is not only at this point in time after coming back to Wyoming a stranger to strange land, but in many ways kind of a stranger to himself. Um, and he's got to deal with this. Okay, he's going to have to try and solve this problem. Okay, and uh, you know, hence the title of the book, okay, which is from an old Basque proverb, that a land of strangers is a land of wolves. Like, and so uh, the strangeness is going to you know, echo you know, with Wolf for a little while to try and exercise himself out. And realistically, as you and I can both attest, as we get older, we just don't rebound physically, <laughs> not only mentally, but you know, it takes a real toll. There's like, that. There's yeah, that. Too. Yeah. On your body. So well, that's, that's the two emails that I get after every book. It's, you know, there was not enough of my favorite character, insert name here. 
<laughs> yeah, whether it be Vic or Henry or you know the dog or whatever, like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you know, I get those. Like, and then the other one is, is you really beat up on Walt pretty bad in the last book. You need to take it easy on him. The next couple of books. Like, so I try and listen, you know, and, and do what people say, like to an extent, like that. But, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I beat up on him too bad in this book. A little bit, but not too bad. Well, let's talk about your two, I think, fascinating things. One, let's talk about the wolf and whether there's a real Wyoming wolf still alive or whether the wolves that you see in Wyoming are Canadian wolves that have escaped from Yellowstone, and, you know, the repopulating wolves. Well, it was interesting, like, because when I started doing a lot of the research on it, which is always the blast, that's the fun part. You know, when I'm laying on the sofa there, you know, in front of the wood-burning stove reading, and Judy's like, are you going to do anything today? And I'm like, hey, I'm working here. I'm research, all right? I'm working really, really hard, all right? And uh, we should all have an excuse like that in our lives. Um, but, it, it, you know, we, uh, it, it, was, it, was the, it was the wolf issue. Like, I just started to do a lot of uh, the research on the wolf issue. Like, and um, I spent a lot of time, like, with the Game and Fish guys, the Game Wardens. And then also they have a large predator response team in Wyoming. So that when you have an attack, like that these guys come in, and nine times out of 10, what they're doing more than anything else is dealing with the public and their response like to whatever it is that might happen. <coughs> and so anyway, I remember talking with these guys from Game and Fish, like it, and they turned right around on me in the first meeting that I had with them, like it, and they said, how many wolves do you think there are in the Bighorn Mountains? You know, the Bighorn Mountains, that's a pretty good sized range. Like, I mean, if you take into account, you know, the, you know, the, the Cloud Peak Wilderness area and the Bighorn Mountain Forest, like the National Forest goes all the way around it, we're talking about an area like, you know, the size of Rhode Island, for God's sake. Like, and so, it, and so they asked me, he said, how many wolves do you think are there? Like, and I said, I don't know, a couple dozen or so. And he, he smiles, he looks at me, and he goes, one, maybe two. Most we've ever had have been three. And he said, it's just too much distance. You, know, you got to get all the way across that basin, you know, from the Lamar Valley over to Yellowstone. Too many ranchers, too many guns, you know, too many people, like, and too many, too many vehicles out on roads. Like, and, and, and these, these, basically these wolves are, they've been kicked off, you know, from whatever pack that they were with. And they're off in search of other packs that don't exist anymore. I mean, in other parts of the country. Like, they end up all the way to the, the very northern extent of Wisconsin, like, to be able to find a, another wolf. And so, you know, the survival rate is actually pretty slim. Like, once they get kicked off, like, and they're out of the park, you know, and traveling like that. But um, in this one, of course, like, that, what happens is, is this wolf happens to be older. You know, he's kind of crippled up and older and gray around the muzzle and all of this. And, you know, kind of, you know, kind of a rogue male been kicked off, you know, from the pack. And amazingly enough, Walt Longmire feels a kind of empathy, uh, you know, for this particular wolf. The situation seems kind of comparable to him to a great extent. But um, but yeah, it, it, you know it was a it was a chance to you know also shed a little bit of light you know on a very controversial issue you know in the American West like to kind of deal with it because I wanted to try and show both sides um, of the issue and I don't want to go too much in too much depth about it because I don't want to give away too many plot points or too many characters but um, but it was fun as usual like it was a, an interesting storyline to go in a different direction and try and uh, find something else out. It's easy to assume that, you know, predators are bad and we should eliminate them, but there's some really bad consequences if you remove all the predators and then you wind up with a big overpopulation. We have Paul Doyron here who's character as a game warden in Maine, but also an investigator, and his book before last took place on an island off Maine where the deer were so overrun. They all had ticks, they all had disease, there was no nothing to eat, they had like, you know, completely wiped out the the flora and all, and because there were no predators, it was up to people to, you know, to kill them, to right. kill them. But if you don't, then they're all going to die anyway because, you know, the, they, the terrain can't support them. So it's a constant. Oh, yeah. But the wolf issue is because they've been like a top tier predator. It's always been really controversial. Oh, yeah. Like, and then, you know, it goes back to like, you know, ranching, like, you know, and uh, predation on, you know, on domestic, you know, on livestock right. and that type of thing. And, you know, there's like one, one part where this one Basque rancher is talking about it, and he's like, have you ever you know, spent the time all night, like, you know, with a, with a lamb, trying to, you know, like, you know, pull a lamb out of a ewe, like that, you know, and bottle feeding it, you know, for a week to try and keep it alive, like, and then finally it starts taking the first steps, and you come back the next day, and its legs have been eaten off. You know, I mean, you know, you kind of have to look, and I, and I think that's important, I think, to try and, like, show as many sides of an issue as you can, especially when it's complex as that. 
So here we are in a time of really hot immigration issues, and you are taking us into a community in Wyoming from the Basque country. They are Basque. Yeah, and they're yeah. largely there for the sheep, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I mean, that, that that was always funny for me, like that, because when Death Without Company came out, which has a large Basque, you know, aspect to it, um, I, I you know would be all over the country, and people would say there are Basques in Wyoming. And I'd be like, yeah, there are a lot of Basques in Wyoming. Like, and then when the books got translated into French and Spanish, and I was in that frontier area, you know, the Basque region, the Pyrenees, like, consistently the first question they would ask, there are Basques in Wyoming? And I'd be like, yeah, you guys lose them or what? You know? <laughs> a lot of them, actually. Like, you know, some of the biggest ranches in Johnson County are owned by Basque families. Like, and, I mean, they're very enterprising, tough people. Like, and and uh, they, they, they took the Wyoming extraordinarily well. Like, and so, and then it, you know, it evolves is what happens. Like, I mean, because what happened at that point in time is a lot of uh, open territory, like at especially upper, you know, forest areas, like that, that got open, you know, by the national, uh, by federal government rather. Um, they weren't really good for cattle, but they were really good for sheep. And there's very little that cowboys know less about than sheep, other than maybe <laughs> women. I don't know. Like, but, um, um, so anyway, like you know, they figured, you know, well, we got to start running sheep is what we have to start doing. Well, if we don't know anything about sheep, we've got to find some people that know about sheep. Well, somebody was smart enough to go, hey, there are these people called the Basques, and they know everything there is to know about sheep. And so they would start bringing, you know, Basques over, um, you know, Basque, you know, guy, they would bring them over, like, at these bachelors, like, that, that would come over and stay at these halfway, you know, Basque hotels, like, at, and then, you know, they put them up in the mountains, like, for three to four months, like, to take care of these sheep. And, um, and like I said, you know, they really took to it extraordinarily well, like, that, and, uh, it was it was amazing to see you know how it changed you know the dynamic you know of livestock within Wyoming too. So, but then things change. Like at, now the economy actually in the Basque regions is really really strong and really good, and so they can't get um, <coughs> they can't get uh, the shepherds to come from you know Europe. So now the majority of them all come from South America. Uh, the majority of them are either you know Brazilian, Argentinian, or something like that. And so, um, and it, it's created like you know different situations too. Like, that. but um, <coughs> it's also the same problems though that you ran into for the Basque uh, region or the Basque uh, shepherds. The same problems that these guys run into. It's not particularly good for you to go out in the middle of nowhere and stay for three or four months and not have anybody to talk to or anybody to interact with. It sounds good sometimes, I would imagine, when you're on one of these highways here around you know, the area like that, but. Um, but generally, it, there's a, a condition that they refer to as sagebrush, and what happens is that these shepherds, like or cowboys, also when they get like on these linemen shacks, and they just they just go nuts. They basically just you know go nuts like that, and uh, a lot of them kill themselves. Like that. And so in this situation, like that, what happens in this book, of course, is is that the, there's a dead sheep at the beginning, which might sound you know kind of familiar because the cold dish, my very first novel, started out with a dead sheep, or what we refer to in Wyoming as a sheepo side. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, this, and so, of course, Vic is like sitting on the tailgate with Walt. She's like, "Doesn't it seem like we've done this before?" Like, you know. But then things kind of change from that point on because they, they have this dead sheep, so they've got to try and find, you know, the shepherd to find out, you know, where is he and why is this happened. Well, they go out to go looking for him, and I don't think I'm giving it too much away. Um, he's hung himself, and um, he's been kind of nibbled on by something. I'm not quite sure what. Like, I'm not sure. You know, it, it might be a suicide, but then as things start rolling along, it, it starts getting a little bit more complex. Like, getting maybe it's not a not a, a suicide at all. Well, <clears throat> if it's a suicide, where's the story going, right? Mm. But, <laughs> um, but no, I think I think the exploration. Actually, Nevada has a serious bat population. Reno, Nevada has lots of bat restaurants. One of oh yeah. The most is a, so it isn't just Wyoming. No, no, no. There are different pockets. You know, there's yeah. these little pockets all over the American West. <clears throat> I think actually the largest population is actually in, in California. I think in Northern California. Mm -hmm. like but um, but yeah, they're, they're scattered all over the place. Okay. They have their own language, which is difficult. You know, Caesar Pretoria um, is a bass. He's the deputy and so forth. How many of you had to practice to say Caesar Pretoria? <laughs> 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 I had to practice. So they're you know it's. Um, that was a problem, actually, for George Guidel. How many lips, how people listen to the audio version of my books? Like George Guidel, who does the audio books. Um, I, I always throw George a curve in practically every book. I mean, and now that his Cheyenne and Crow has gotten decent, you know, I, I've got him speaking bass. Like, you know, and it was so funny because there he is in New York, right? 
And he was like, you know, you got the manuscript, like he's reading it, like it, and he goes, I don't know how to speak Basque. What am I going to do now? And I was like, you don't have anybody that speaks Basque in the entire city of New York? And he goes, I don't know anybody. <laughs> and so I said, I know two or three people here in Buffalo, Wyoming. I can hook you up. Like, so we hooked him up. Like, and so I had some experts on the end to teach him how to speak Basque. And so. yeah, they did part of the books, but the well, seats of the jury, so I was, but, you know, but kind of around the edges, but it was interesting to go into there, you know, oh, Basque, the culture, it's a Basque yeah. held ranch. Well, and this is a, this is a particular family like that, that has a history. Um, this is the family that, you know, had the ancestor that shot Lucian Connolly's leg off. And so there's a, there's a long history between this outlaw Basque family like that and uh, the Sheriff's Department of Absaroka County. And, uh, and, it, and it's fun for me to go back and circle around like that and get you guys like that, you know, because you think you know what a story is, like that, you know, because I've told you what the story is, right? And I would not ever tell you not the whole story, right? Uh, so anyway, like, um, we, we discovered that there's a lot more to this story that maybe we didn't know, like that. And uh, I, I really enjoy doing that. I, I, that's one of the funnest things I love to do is like circle back around and pick something up from a previous book, like and utilize it, like that in the current books. Like, and uh, you finally get to hear the true story about what happened. Illusion so. well, is great. So Lucia is Lucian is how old? Uh, I don't, I don't, don't know. Really know. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't get caught up in that whole age thing. Yeah, I really don't. Right. Like, I don't pay much attention to that. Lucian's been around a really long time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a Doolittle Raider. Like, it's, so, you know, he's got to be of a certain age. Right. Well, so, not, but, so, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the fun part about it is, is like they're working those layers, you know, and re-thread, you know, some of those loose threads from previous books and put them back in. Like, it was funny, I was doing an interview earlier uh, here here in the store, like they came in and did the interview with me this afternoon, and they were asking me about some plot points that were in a previous book, and I was like, oh yeah, those are gonna, that's for books in the future, is what those are, like, and uh, you know, that, that uh, I always love planting the idea of a book in the future, like three or four books previous, because you guys are pretty sharp, and you hang on to that stuff, you know, and so then whenever I'm able to come through for you here in about three or four years, look at and you remember, wait a minute, yeah, that was mentioned. That was mentioned about four years back, as a matter of fact. You know, I mean, and there are even a couple in this one, like I've already planted the seeds for too. So the Cheyenne Nation is doing well, but what about some of Walter's other side picks? Oh well, that that was I blame. You know, this was supposed to be really a serious book. It really was. I mean, it, really, it deals with some social issues that are kind of weighty, and um, and when I got started on it, it it just didn't go that direction, and I blame Vic Moretti completely. <laughs> like that because she's not getting laid on any kind of regular basis. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, which is the source of some. You know, and, and she her. she didn't get much of a voice in Depth of Winter. You know, she was in there a couple of times, but that was it. And so she came roaring back, you know, with a vengeance in this one, like that. And uh, you know, I, no matter how hard I tried, like that, you know, the, the character just kept, you know, you know. It, it's, you know, those of you who know me know well that Judy, my wife, is kind of the basis, you know, for Vic, you know, and so anytime I would write one piece of dialogue, I always knew what the smart-ass response was going to be, <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of a weakness that when you get a good smart-ass response, you got to use it, you know, so, so anyway, like, she, she kind of hijacked my book to a certain extent, but, the, and then, um, and then, you know, Cesar Vittoria, like that, you know, has a, a larger role in this one, and then also there's a major conflict um, between Ruby and Walt um, in this book. Yeah, um, and it actually I drew it from an actual dispatcher-sheriff um, interaction back in Wyoming. Uh, what happened was is there was this one, uh, I won't name the county because I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but there was this one county where the sheriff didn't have a computer and the, the dispatcher would literally have to print out the emails and leave them on his desk so he could write the answers and then she would collect them and take them back and then <coughs> respond on the computer, you know, once she got back. Okay. And so this is kind of what's happening with Wall, you know, and, and Ruby's gotten to the point where she's like, I, I don't need to be doing this foolishness anymore. Like okay. I really, really don't. Look okay. at and so she kind of lowers the boom on Walt, like, and kind of fools him into ordering a computer for himself. Um, he accidentally requisitions new computers for the whole staff, and he gets one. <laughs> and throughout the majority of the book, he uses it as an end table <laughs> in his office. 
I see he thinks about getting a little, you know, a little, you know, tablecloth for it, maybe a little lamp, you know, for the box, like that, you know, but finally he has to unplug it and get it out, you know, and unload it and, and put it up there. And it's a major, it's it's a major pain in the ass for everybody in the office, like it really is, like it. But, uh, but, you know, that's part of the, the, the deal, I think, when you're writing a series also is, is that, you know, you really, the, the characters have to evolve. They have to, to develop, you know, and maybe in, in ways that you don't suspect, you know, that they're going to, you know, especially within the relationships that they have, you know, in that book. Okay. And so, you know, for me, it, it, it's always going to be a, a big process of character development, you know, and seeing where it is that they're going to go and what's going to happen and how they're going to deal, you know, with the things, you know, that get unloaded on them like that by the other characters. Well, it's hard enough to get a really good Wi-Fi here in downtown Scottsdale. So how does it work? You know, I think Cesar Vittori actually has the best line about that. Like that, when he's hooking it up, he's like, "What are you doing?" He says, "I'm hooking up your modem." Like, he goes, "What's a modem?" He says, "Nobody knows what a modem does. It's just you hook it up and it's magic and it works." Because <laughs> <laughs> it made me start looking at like you know, how I did a computer too. Because Walt was like trying to send an email, and he's like, "How do you do this?" And she goes, "With Walter." And she keeps having to come back into the office and explain the most simple things to him, you know. And she's like, it's the little, you know, it's the little paper airplane on the upper right-hand corner. And he's like, that's clever. He has no reference, you know, to work with. You know, he's working with nothing here, so it's a little bit difficult. I'm trying to remember how this went, but I know one point my husband was selling some um, photographic software that demanded um, computer use. And I, anyway... Was that somebody called and had an apple and they just couldn't make it work and so Ross said to them, you know, well, so under the apple, do this or that, and there was this long pause and funny sounds, and the person at the other end was actually prying the apple off the computer. <laughs> <laughs> under the apple was an unfortunate <laughs> That's an expensive. We come a long way in a very short time. You can really think about it. You know, when, when I started the store in 1989, we used to print out a newsletter that had a print order form, and we mailed it out to people, and people would send it back all filled in with checks. And, you know, we had a fax machine that had international numbers programmed into it, and so we get an order from some guy in Japan, but it wasn't all that easy to collect because, you know, you didn't have credit cards. So, and, you know, it, it's really, it wasn't that long ago. No. It was like that, and now, you know, it's just so completely different. Oh, yeah. I think that the technological leaps have been almost like the speed of light. Oh, yeah. Like it's so no wonder Walt yeah. is, um, you know, he's a relic, right? Yeah. In a yeah, lot yeah. of ways. So he's a it, dinosaur. There's no yeah, two ways about it. Really it really is. <laughs> right. So what do you envision this point? And nobody... Nobody's going to come out too battered up from this one. So, what do you think is going to happen in the next one? Oh well, I'm 13 chapters into that one. I guess, uh, the next one. But I, you know what? I would tell you a quick story though, just just to give you an impression of just how important you guys are all to me. Okay, um, I was up in Alaska and I was fishing, and you don't really fish in Alaska; you just catch. <laughs> and they dropped me off at this one like a sandbar, like it was gravel bar. It's about 100 yards long. Like it, and they said, going down at the end of the gravel bar. And then, you know, you can fish off the tailings of that, and then there's a creek that comes on the other side. The water's only about three feet deep over to the other side. Like, I had waders on. Like, and they said, you can get over there, and you can fish those tailings, too. So I thought, great. Like, so I'm walking down there with my little seven weight on my shoulder, like that, and I get down to the end of the tailings there, and I look over, and there's this big lump in the water. Like, and I thought, oh, it's a boulder. Great. Like, and I can go over and climb up on this boulder, and, like, and I can really get some altitude, and I can really, you know, whip that seven line down through there. Like, it'd be great. Like, I start to take a step into the water, and about that time, the boulder rolls over and stands up. <laughs> and even in three feet of water, it was about 10 feet taller than me, okay? <laughs> and I'm standing there, and I'm about as far as, like, from me to where that, that right there, where that, uh, that, that bookcase is right there on that part of the wall there. And, I mean, <clears throat> it's the biggest bear I've ever seen in my entire life. It looked like a, a furry Volkswagen. Is what it <laughs> And I'm standing there, like, and I'm thinking, you know, it, it, that's only three feet of water, and he's only that far away. If he's going to be on me before I'm going to be able to do anything. And the only thing that went through my mind was, I have three more chapters in that. <laughs> <laughs> and Judy doesn't know how this one ends. <laughs> and I thought, this sucks. You know? 
And so I just stood there for a second, like, and he looked at me, like, and then finally just kind of, you know, blew out his lips like this. And then by that time, the guys that were up the sandbar were making some noise, and they were coming down that way. And so he heard them, like, and he turns around, scampered, you know, back up the hillside, like at the split the cane, like at the wind blew into the weeds there. But uh, but y'all wanted you guys to know I was thinking about you. Know? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he probably wasn't a hungry bear because he'd been gorging on whatever. Salmon, was the salmon. Yeah, yeah. That's the first thing they always tell you. They always tell you, you know, throw the salmon in one direction, and then you run in the other direction, because they will recognize the salmon as edible. You. Maybe not, you know? <laughs> so, and unfortunately, I had not caught anything that day already. Like I said, there was nothing to throw, so. Well, there's plenty of what Dennis Avenel calls death by Alaska. Oh, gosh, tons of them. Tons are not of them. But then are you asking about the next book? I you're asking about the next book. Okay. Which the next, survived to write. Not, which I have. Well, so far, you know, we'll see. Like, you know, I've still got a lot of splitting to do with the splitter up there, so we'll, we'll see. Like, but, um, yeah, the next one, actually, uh, is I don't know how to describe this? I guess I need to do a little history lesson here first. Um, the there's a painting, uh, and it's a painting that all of you have seen. I can guarantee you that you have seen it. Um, there was a painter by the name of Cassili Adams, like at, who um, about ten years after uh, the, the Little Bighorn uh, fight, um, painted this painting that was like about nine and a half feet by sixteen feet long, and it was called Custer's Last Fight. Okay, and um, it's not a great painting, like that, you know. But its social significance will become, you know, very evident here in a matter of moments. Um, the, the, at, the, at that point in time, what they did a lot of times was they would paint these big, huge paintings of historic events. Like, okay? and then what they would do is send the painting out um, all over the country, and people would pay two bits, like, to go in and see the painting. So it was like it was before movies and TV and all that stuff. Like, so I mean, it was so they could, you know, see this historic moment unfold before their eyes, you know. And so um, this thing went out on tour, okay. and um, all over the country, like, and they came back to St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, the owner of the big saloon in uh, right next to the train station in St. Louis bought the painting, and he bought the painting and he put it up on the wall like that. And about I don't know what it was like twenty or thirty years later, the saloon went out of business. The saloon went out of business like that, and they went bankrupt. And one of their biggest debtors was a small brewery in St. Louis called. Anheuser Bush. <laughs> and Augie Bush, you know, came down there like and walked in the saloon and looked around and said, You owe me ten thousand dollars. And they said, We're bankrupt, we don't have anything. And he goes, I'll take the painting. And so they took the painting off the wall, rolled it up, took it back to their headquarters, like and Augie Bush said, You know, what we're gonna do with this, we're gonna make posters. We're gonna make posters of this painting, and we're gonna send these posters to every bar, every saloon, everywhere, all over the country. And introduced them to Anheuser Busch, you know, uh, Budweiser beer. Well, in a matter of years, they became the largest, you know, brewery in the United States, possibly the world, right? Okay, and at one point in time, I think it was over two million posters that they had sent out. They even sent them to uh, servicemen in World War One overseas, like you know, kind of bolster morale and all this, like, and I, and I do think that, like, other than Libby, you know, uh, Custer, like, that, that, that poster might be responsible for, like, elevating Custer to the point, you know, where he was seen as this, like, incredibly romantic, heroic figure, like, which is questionable, like, and so, anyway, um, this painting was there, like, and they, you know, made all these posters and done all this stuff, and finally, I guess it was, like, you know, between the wars, like, between World War One and World War Two. um, Bush says, oh, you know what, let's, let's, we're going to give the painting back to the, we're going to give it to the 7th Cavalry, is what we'll do. And they were based in Fort Bliss in Texas at that period in time. Like, so they donated and gave it to the 7th Cavalry. Like, and they took this 16 and a half by 9 and a half foot painting and put it on the commissary walls, is what they did. Like, and it, it hung there in the commissary walls until 1946 when the commissary burned to the ground and the painting was destroyed. Oh. Or was it? <laughs> the next Walt book is called The Next to Last Stand. <laughs> so it's going to be Walt's first art heist book. Okay, so we have that to look forward to. I hope you'll enjoy it. We'll have to create a replica and hang it behind us. Hey, you know there are lots of them available on eBay. Really. <laughs> Just about any size you want, I tell you. Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this was something that you know, I gotta admit, like that that was like a, a, a rabbit hole that I had avoided for years. I mean, I love doing 
Western history, like I love reading, you know, military history and all that kind of stuff. I had avoided, you know, the Little Bighorn because there are so many books written about it, so much material. How many movies have they made, you know, about it? For gosh sakes, like, and uh, you know, and so I, I'd avoided it because I thought I'm not falling down that you know, that wormhole. I'm not doing that. And so finally, you know, whenever I decided I was going to write this book, that's when I had to delve into it. And all I can tell you is. There are a lot of really bad Custer books out there. I gotta tell you. <laughs> there are a couple of good ones. There are a couple of really good ones. Um, it was funny because I, I read uh, the Nathaniel Philbrook, uh, The Last Stand, and uh, I got to go do the, uh, the Nantucket Book Festival, and one of the great things was, you know, he was there. Like, and I walked over to him, and I said, I absolutely love, you know, your, your book, The Last Stand, you know, and the Custer books. Like, it's, 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 you know, it's fantastic because it's, it's such a good job of explaining how this battle happened and what went wrong or what went right, you know, and I have to admit that that's one of the funny things. I was talking to Charles Little Old Man one time about the Custer battlefield, and I said something about, you know, not being any survivors, and he goes, well, yeah, there were thousands of survivors, Craig, they just weren't white. <laughs> <laughs> so, the learning curve continues. <laughs> Daniel Philbrook's a lovely guy. He is, he is. Times, and, you know, I, I always forget that he lives out there on the island. Out on the island, yeah. My, you know, my wife had to explain that to me, that when we were going to go to the Nantucket Book Festival, I was like, well, we'll just fly into Logan Airport in Boston and just drive over. She goes, Greg, it's an island. <laughs> I was like, shit. <laughs> and just being dramatically gentrified, they had a feature in the Wall Street Journal on Fridays. They do this thing called Mansion, which tells you about how you, for only $30 million, you know, you can buy this or that. It's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's not even the 1%. It's like the 0.01%. <laughs> but many of them have now landed on Nantucket. Mm. And so they're having, this part I love, the contest that the super rich on Nantucket are having is who can have the best bar in their home. And they had, like, this woman standing proudly behind something that looked as though it fell out of Versailles. Oh and, God. you know, another one that's, like, Roman and all. I mean, you know, it's just, like, competing with... And, it was only like two or three hundred thousand dollars to install a I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's right. So, um, I, Nantucket is obviously another of those places where a few people have descended and, you know, are changing the entire. Oh, yeah. Which has happened to so many places, you know, Aspen and Dale and. Sense, well, it needed a new industry because the whaling thing was not working out. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's really true. Yeah, so now it's the tourist thing. Or build your own home bar. You want to be a homer modeler in Nantucket. You really get to do it. You could send more people there. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Walt trying to eat a lobster. <laughs> There's a lot of comic potential there. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 as a buffer. But what, what, is, what about Walt's more elusive Indian friend? Not, not Henry, but... Virgil? Virgil. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to give away too much, like that, but there's, like, you know, there's, there's some... There's some potential aspects of Virgil, like that, actually, in the Land of Wolves. Like, I don't want to give too much away, like that, but... Uh, but, you know, I, I'll say that. That's what I'll leave it at for now. It's really nice to know that Virgil is back with us. But I think we need to answer questions from the audience. Sure, sure, happy to. Happy to. Anybody got any questions or anything? Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us a little about your Christmas email this year? Oh, the Christmas, oh, the, the short stories. Yeah, I got the little short stories, stories I send out. Like, I, I, you know what? I always forget to mention anything about that. Thank you. Um, if you go and you go to CraigAllenJohnson.com and sign up for my newsletter, which I sometimes send out every two or three or four months, <laughs> so I'm not going to overload your inbox, trust me. Like I, but what I do is at Christmas time, I actually send out um, a short story, a Walt Longmire Christmas story. Like I've actually already started this year's Christmas story um, because I was talking to a, a, a sheriff's deputy there in Wyoming who told me the story. Um, <clears throat> I'll just tell it to you real quick. It's not going to give anything too much away. Um, it was in a town that will remain nameless for right now. Like that. And what happened was this guy got the bright idea to give all of his siblings 23 and Me kits, and they would all open them on Christmas together. The story's called Who's Your Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> and 
evidently there was a domestic disturbance. I guess, uh, small appliances with room windows. And the, 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 the mother had left a black notebook with notes for the children, you know, just in case you know they needed this information later on in life. You know. So that's that's There's another the whole to to. new range of plots <laughs> from from this technique. But in, even in true crime, you know, there's oh, yeah. a whole oh, lot yeah. of interesting stuff going on. I like the title though, which we gave. Yeah. It could be better for Christmas. Right. Anybody <laughs> else? You guys are quiet tonight. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yes, sir. Movie. Oh, we're still waiting. I mean, right now we still got that six uh six year six season um, contract you know, with Netflix, like as far as the TV show is concerned, like that. And until that comes to an end, you know, we're kind of in a, in a holding pattern right now. I do know that like, you know, um, it's interesting to me like that because a lot of the studios have you know, kind of pulled back their material from Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all this kind of stuff and started up their own streaming services. And so Warner Brothers made an announcement about six months ago that they were gonna do their own streaming service to and so I can't help but wonder, you know, if Warner Brothers owns it, you know, it'd be kind of silly for them to not think about, you know, utilizing it for themselves. So we'll see what happens. I've got a, a big event, you know, actually coming up um, in, uh, get, get this, Beverly Hills. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did too. I laughed at first. It. it was, a, it's at the, uh, the, the, the Writers Guild um, Theater. Um, in Beverly Hills, like that. and so um, the majority of the cast, just about almost all the cast, are going to be there, plus the producers, like that, to do an event with it, which is kind of nice. I mean, the show's not been in production for two years, and these people are still willing to come out and do an event. I mean, they still come up to Buffalo for Longmire Days, all these things, like that. But yeah, it's kind of weird to be going into Beverly Hills. They're putting us up at the Beverly Hills Hilton, <laughs> right? And I only know one Beverly Hills Hilton story. Do you guys want to hear it? Yes. Hear it? Yes. All right. So uh, it's, it's actually not my story, it's Michael Caine's story. And Michael Caine, um, after he finished Alfie, um, they flew him over like at the United States, like at the screen test him, you know, for a bunch of different stuff, and they put him in the Beverly Hills Hilton. And, uh, and he said, you know, they forgot about me for like a week. And he said, I just sat around and drank wine and ate room service, you know, and you know, went down in the lobby and sat on a chair and tried to spot movie stars is what I tried to do. And, uh, and he said he was sitting down there one day, like, and he said all of a sudden there was this noise outside on the main lawn, you know, beside where the restaurant was, and he says, you know, and flower arrangements are flying through the air, like in the bushes and everything are all waving, all this kind of stuff, and a helicopter lands out in the front lawn, you know, the Beverly Hills Hilton, like and he said, John Wayne gets out of the helicopter and comes walking over, you know, to the front desk, and he said he's still wearing his whole costume from some western that he was in, you know, with a six-shooter, and it covered up with dust and all this kind of stuff, comes over, you know, and orders up a room, like at dinner that night, like that. And he looks over and sees, you know, Michael Caine sitting there, and he goes, hey, kid, are you an actor? And he goes, uh, yes, sir, I am. He says, were you in that movie, Alfie? And he goes, yes, sir, I was. Like, and he goes, you're going to be a star, kid. You're going to be a big star someday. And he says, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, sir. Like, and he goes, got a couple of pieces of advice for you if you want them. And he goes, well, sure, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to hear him. Like that. And he goes, talk low, talk slow, and don't talk too much, kid, all right? And he goes, okay. And he says, you got to lose those suede shoes, too. And he goes, all right, I can kind of understand the first piece of advice, but why, can I, why can't I wear my suede shoes? He said, because, kid, you're going to be in a bathroom somewhere standing in a urinal, and some guy's going to be standing next to you, and he's going to go, hey, are you Mike Kane? <laughs> you your shoes. <laughs> Here's been dying to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, let's not end on that. <laughs> No, as a general rule, I, you know, I don't get, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not bragging, but, you know, I, I, I pretty much get it right. I, I mean, I miss a few things every once in a while, but as a general rule, no, they're pretty excited. The problem I have is, of course, that they recognize all the people that are in my books. Because <laughs> you know, there are only 500,000 people in the whole state of Wyoming, you know. And I, you know, when I'm doing a rough draft, like, I'll just stick people in there just, you know, because I, you know, somebody I know, I don't have to work on that character because I know them immediately. Well, then I lose track of them sometimes. And I don't remember until the book comes out, 
And then somebody will call me and go, hey, am I on page 189 in your book? And I'm like, no. Yeah, I think you are. And you're like, you didn't kill anybody, though. Like, so we're cool, right? <laughs> but yeah, and everybody knows everybody else. Like, you know, so even when I change the names, they all know who I'm talking about. Like, the only place that's even worse is up on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation because, like, you know, there's only about, like, I think it's like 5,000 members, you know, enrolled members of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. So they all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I put anybody in my books. The nice thing about that is the books and the TV show are really popular up on the res. Look at, and so it's gotten to the point now where there are a bunch of people on the res that claim to be in my books that I've never met. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. I think that's nice. <laughs> Somebody else have their hand up. Yes, ma'am. When will they announce the dates for the... Oh God, I don't know. I don't. I don't have anything to do with that. Oh, you know, I, I, I don't even want to know. Look at, uh, I, don't, I don't want to get involved. Look at it's. Uh, it's better that I don't know that information. You know, probably because I blurted it out. Like, you know, which they did. And Robert and Adam Robert blurted did. it out yeah, on Facebook one you know, last year. Was yeah, it last, last year? year? They blew it. You know, and yeah. said it out loud. And then looked at each other like this. You know, like, yeah, I'm like actors, really? Yeah. You, know, you can't trust them with anything. Look at so. So I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I would assume sometime in that, that latter part of like July, like at the beginning of August, there's always that window of opportunity where it is. So, so, so how about yes, one more. Um, can you, excuse me, Allie, can you talk about the difference between your books and a series? Uh huh. Like dog isn't there and a whole bunch of stuff. Right. How I found you. <laughs> my girlfriend's from Laramie. Uh -huh. and, and I said, oh, have you seen the series on TV? And she said, no. And then she came over and we started watching it. I can't sit anymore. Uh -huh. That's not the way it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started reading the book. It's, uh, okay. you know, it was interesting, like, yeah, because the, at the very first meeting that I had with the producers, no one of the first things they said was, your books like don't break down into a 42-minute so teleplay very easily. And I said, no, thank God. <laughs> yeah, they did. You shouldn't be reading them, for God's sake. Like, you know, so, you know, I, I kind of, you know, went into it with my eyes open, kind of knowing that, you know, that they were going to have to streamline everything like they were going to, have to lose some characters they were going to have to you know really make it more of a procedural kind of base you know tv show that type of thing like that and, and it's always going to be hard you know whenever you take written material like it and try and do something with it you know in a cinematic sense like that because the one incredible secret weapon that i've got that poor hollywood doesn't have it's your imagination you know i mean it, until robert taylor came along Aww. You know, I could have gone through this room and asked every single one of you, you know, with a crime sketch artist, you know, like a courtroom sketch artist, you know, to tell me what Walt Longmire looked like. We would have had 150 different Walt Longmires. Like, and uh, the funny thing for me also is that I used to always make a point of saying Walt is not the six foot two of Twisted Steel and Sex Appeal. And then along came Robert Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. There's yeah. a gentleman way back there. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the novellas are continuing on just because, I mean, just because you have an idea that's not a 400-page idea doesn't mean it's a bad idea, you know? They're just, it's, the publishing industry is not really open to, like, that, you know, kind of smaller book a lot of times, like, yeah, but, you know, after I talked them into doing Spirit of Steamboat, it, it was like the state read for the state of Wyoming, and it sold, you know, I don't know, eight different, you know, co you know different versions, volumes of it, like, and then, uh, then Highwayman. Did extraordinarily well too. Like it, and so I kind of proved to them that you know you could take a shorter story like that, and just you know because it was shorter didn't mean it was good. Um, one thing I hate to do, like and I will never do, like it, is take a, a, a book like that and then pad it out and try and make it into a full size novel. It's just not going to be any good, you know. Whereas as a novel and a novella rather like that, it, it seemed to work pretty well. The short stories, absolutely. I think I'm up to about I think eight short stories now. And there will definitely be more uh, more collections of the short stories. I mean, that you know, I'm writing one a year, like at sometimes two a year, just for the fun of it. Um, whenever I get an idea together, like that. But uh, you know, it's it's a it's an opportunity to stretch you know like literary muscles that are different from the ones that you use every day, you know, to write the novels. Like that. and I think that's kind of important uh, to a great extent. The one that I'm working on now, the novella that I'm working on now, is called Tooth and Claw, um, and it's Walt's experiences after the. Uh, Johnston Atoll, Vietnam, like that when he's in Alaska. So, uh, 
that one's you know, in the future too. Like it's, I'll get it done, I promise. I promise. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. This is a moment when I'm going to wave goodbye to our Facebook, our video audience over here. And we are now going to give away.